very much, Chris. Good morning. This is the shipping forecast issued by the Met Office on behalf of the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency at 0505 on Tuesday, the 11th of April. There are warnings of gales in all areas except Trafalgar, Bailey, Faroes and South East Iceland. The general synopsis at midnight, low 4992. Good afternoon, it's Easter 2023. Welcome back to Trafalgar Square where we started this series of videos about 18 months ago with Bus 24 where I set out to find out just how far I could get by bus from here, the centre point of London, in 24 hours. Well, back then I said, surely the answer lies to the north or the west and I think technically that's true. But I've been thinking, what if, as a treat, you were allowed a ferry as well as those buses? Could you maybe get a little bit further? And I started to wonder, in fact, could I get to Paris in 24 hours? Is that possible? And I looked and looked and looked at the timetables and thought, no, doesn't work, no, doesn't quite work, no, doesn't quite work. Then I suddenly realised, once a month, when the tide is right, or perhaps more accurately, the tide is wrong, and the ferry runs a bit later, it just about works. You should be able to do 24 hours from here, the zero point of London, to the zero point of Paris, just outside Notre Dame Cathedral, in 24 hours, by local bus and one ferry. And we're going to try that out today. It all, hopefully it will work, there's some very tight connections, there's also some very leisurely ones. And there's a storm brewing in the channel, so who knows what impact that will have. But let's go find out. At 3.45pm, because that's the time that I think works best, we're going to start our journey. When we did the ferryless bus 24, I managed to get from here to Morecambe, Lancashire, 339.4 kilometres from Charing Cross. If we managed to get to Notre Dame, that would be 343.8 kilometres as the crow flies, with a beaten bus 24 by just under four and a half kilometres. And a remarkable fact, which you can check for yourself the next time you'll join a straight line on the map from Morecambe bus station to Notre Dame Cathedral, it doesn't just pass through London, it passes directly through the traffic island that is the site of Charing Cross. Clearly, this is meant to be. With the tail end of a march of striking junior doctors clearing right on cue, buses start moving and I can hop on the number 11 for by far the shortest leg of the journey, a few hundred metres up the strand. This is one of those faux route masters that the former mayor was so keen on, but with no more hopping off the back platform, I have to petition the driver to let me off early when traffic snarl ups threaten my connection to Oldwich. No, we don't want you, number 168. We want your cousin, the X68, lurking there, just behind. The X68 is a rarity, a London Express bus. There's only four express routes in the capital, though the week before I made this journey, the Mayor announced plans for lots more on orbital routes. The X68 runs in the big direction only, providing a fast-ish route to the centre for some Norwood rail deserts. This is the first southbound bus of the day at just before 4pm and catching it was vital for this journey to work. Waterloo Station, Waterloo Road. Non-stop to West Norwood. X, non-stop to West Norwood. With the driver making no fewer than three announcements in order to get rid of any Camberwell or Streatham bound stowaways, we leave Waterloo onto the express bit of the journey. We're timetabled for 35 minutes non-stop to West Norwood, probably the longest distance between stops anywhere in London. Using the X68 saves us a lot of time over the chain of all-stop buses we'd otherwise have to use to get out of London. 24 hours wouldn't be possible otherwise. So it's essential to travel on a day that tides mean the overnight ferry leaves late enough that you can catch it off the first Croydon-bound X68. And when neither that day or the following day is a weekend or a French bank holiday. That leaves about one day a month when it precariously comes together. The other unique work of the X68 is that on the express section, it can be sent to whichever route is most traffic free. Today, we're going via Kennington and Brixton. Tomorrow, it could be via the Elephant and Castle in Camberwell. It's a magical mystery tour of South London. It 
It's a long haul up Tulse Hill, past endless rows of former London County Council housing blocks, but at last we're at the first stop since Waterloo, Robson Road in West Norwood, and we're running 10 minutes early. I'm genuinely impressed by the passenger behind me who's passed the entire half hour non-stop stretch in a single phone call. I thought we were still in the rainy heights of South London, but is that the Eiffel Tower I can see already? Alas, no, just the Bristol Palace DV mask. However, as we begin our descent to Selhurst, the front seat comes free, and Mrs Turtle and I can take up our rightful place. We're also escaping mobile phone man. We're picking up lots of passengers now as we edge towards Croydon. There's an unspoken solidarity emerging amongst those of us who've been on since central London, with much silent collective tutting at these interlopers. Thanks to the X68 arriving 10 minutes early at West Croydon's architecturally pleasing bus station, it's not the mad dash I was expecting to the other side of Croydon centre for the next bus. And mobile phone obsessive man ran after me to hand me my scarf after I left it behind, so never judge a book, etc. I get to briefly pause in the freezing rain in the heart of this huge town that would be a city if it wasn't subsumed by London to admire the 16th century almshouses, then trot on to Park Street from where, despite being a red London bus, the 405 will take us a good five miles into deepest, darkest Surrey. As we pick our way through the southernmost tendrils of London, the dark line of the North Downs escarpment appears through the murk, the first of two ridge lines we must cross between the Thames and the Channel. You can tell we're in the outer suburbs now, not just from the endless lines of mock Tudor and mock castellated villas among the magnolias along the main road south, but also because the bus is finally getting to skip some stops for lack of custom. With alarming suddenness, the houses stop. The post-war Greenbelt legislation still halts London's growth here, and we swish through damp green fields towards the Surrey village of Hooley. Two and a quarter hours in, and we're out of Greater London. Just beyond, we navigate the strange half-completed junction where the M23, the motorway from Brighton, still comes to a grinding halt. Had it been completed, it would have sliced its way through much of South London to meet one of the notorious ringways, orbital roads that would themselves have demolished the other half of South London. So much planning history in these couple of miles. We're over the North Downs now, through a gap where a prehistoric river once flowed into the Thames and into the muddy lands of the Weald beyond, where oversized commuter towns like Red Hill have taken deep root among the copses, riding stables and business parks. Red Hill bus station is where this straggling branch of the TfL Empire ends its journey, a bright red interloper among the blue, white and turquoise of Metro bus. And it's also here that things start to go wrong. There's no sign of my next bus on the bus station departure board the 460 that should race me straight down the main road to Crawley to catch the last bus to the coast. A look at the Bus Times website live map reveals it sitting, apparently unmoving, six miles away in Tadworth. A difficult choice faces me. Hang around, hope the 460 starts moving and makes the 20 minute connection in Crawley, or hop in hope onto a 422, just ready to depart now, which takes to say circuitous route to Gatwick Airport next door to Crawley, and hope, like Mr Micawber, that something will turn up there. I think Mr Micawber was hoping a bus would turn up. It's a decade since I've read any Dickens. At the last minute, with no sign of the 460 moving, I spin the wheel and hop on the 422. No one has ever accused Metro Line's 422 of getting anywhere quickly. In order to ensure places remain served as bus routes have been cut, surviving routes have taken on more and more circuitous meanderings. I suspect the 422 is one such route, a sorry version of the Flying Dutchman, doomed to travel every road in the merged towns of Red Hill and Reigate endlessly. This makes for a oddly disjointed journey for the rare fruit passenger. You're wandering through some post-war estates, then suddenly out on a windswept common, before plunging back into suburbia to loop round the back of a mini-market. It's a friendly enough bus. A lady offers a fellow passenger who smells incredibly strongly of cheap cider, some of her biscuits from Aldi, but its southward progress is frustratingly slow for those of us bound for the City of Light, or even for Gatwick. At last, we've served every corner of Rygate, the bus's nose swings south and we gallop off through the fields to... 
some more backstreet meanderings in rapidly expanding Hawley. But it is great to see new build estates incorporating features like bus gates so the 422 doesn't have to do a 360 degree turn at the end of each cul-de-sac, a welcome step away from a total car centric design to new build areas. Finally, dual carriageways guide us to Gatwick's South Terminal. There's a quarter of an hour before I need to be at Crawley, five or so miles away. If there was some stray, late-running bus leaving immediately, it might just work. I scan the departure board in unoptimistic hope. Nothing. Just a massively delayed 460, finally free of the Tadworth Triangle, but still nearly ten minutes away. It won't make it to Crawley bus station in time. I make a split-second decision to abandon the purest form of the challenge, but save the journey. Just after leaving Crawley, the bus to the coast passes Freebridges Railway Station, four minutes on the train from Gatwick. If I get the next train, it should get me to Freebridges one minute before the bus is due. A little under three miles on the train is worth it for the slim chance of making 99% of the journey by bus, I reckon. Then just as my train arrives, I pick up a message from a Twitter follower who's kindly asked a friend who's asked a friend at Crawley bus station to hold the Brighton bus for the late running 460. Alas, there's now no way I'd get back up to the bus stop in time. But maybe this could have all worked. Oh well, back to the train. The train was spot on time, the bus a minute or so late, so astonishingly we made the one minute connection onto the 272 from a stop between the Snooty Fox pub and Lidl. The driver had been prompted to look out for a bedraggled traveller of a turtle, so introductions were made and we were off into the soaking wet West Sussex woods. Just like a cut price version of the Father, Son and Holy Ghost, Mrs Turtle and I have caught the last bus to the coast and by the skin of our shell. The next stop is really pond. Beyond the village of Crawley Down, our emptying double-decker climbs steadily to the exposed heights of Selsfield Common, 170 metres above sea level. Up here it becomes evident what a vile night it is. The early gusts of what would become Storm Noah whipping violently around the bus. The school of the school of rain slams into us. I'm half expecting a text to say the ferry is cancelled, but hopefully things are a bit calmer at sea level. There's a lovely moment of comparative calm, however, as we run into Lindfield on the edge of Haywards Heath to a peal of bells. It's bell ringing practice night at All Saints Church, and it'll take more than an Atlantic gale to postpone that. The final barrier before the channel are the South Downs, higher and wilder than their northern counterpart. The 272 breasts the Downs at Clayton, and on this charming evening I'm just about able to resist the invitation of the automated announcement to alight to walk the South Downs way or visit the Jack and Jill windmills. I'll press on to Brighton, thanks. We hop off the 272 at Mrs Turtle's spiritual home, the Sea Life Centre, right on the Brighton seafront beside the White Horse Flecked English Channel. Plans for a late dinner at Chips on the Pier are shelved because A the pier is locked up and B the chips would just blow away. We may be at the Channel but we're not able to cross it just yet. Despite being Britain's most famous seaside town, Brighton's never been much of a port. The lack of shelter on this straight bit of coastline ensured ships went elsewhere. So we've got one more bus in Britain yet. I'm joining the little huddled crowd awaiting the eastbound coaster, aka the number 12, Brighton and Hove Buses flagship route. A lovely run when it's not dark and bucketing it down. It's a 30 minute hop from Brighton to New Haven, hugging the cliff girt coast on this well patronised comfortable bus. In the darkness we roll through the strange gridiron meridian straddling settlement of Peacehaven. 
No one ever seems to have worked out if the entrepreneur who sold plots of land here as homes for heroes in a town wants to be called New Anzac was actually a scammer or not. New Haven is a misnomer. It's not new, there's been a port here at the mouth of the Ouse since medieval times when Seaford has silted up. And to add to the confusion, for the ferry port, you get off the bus next to the town railway station, not the harbour halt. It's a short walk through the puddles from the bus stop to the foot passenger check-in for the Dieppe ferry. There's not many of us in here on this storm-tossed evening, and on checking in, the news is not terrible, but not great. The Seven Sisters should have arrived from France for her midnight return voyage about an hour ago, but thanks to Storm Noah, she's currently hanging around just off the coast. The wind's too high for her to attempt a narrow entrance into the River Ouse and New Haven's Harbour. The friendly staff tell me they expect the sailing to happen, they're just not sure when. It all depends on a break in the weather. Deprived of any dinner, I settle in for a potentially long wait, sharing a bag of bizarre after eight mini eggs from the vending machine with Mrs Turtle. Time ticks on, and then, refreshing the ship tracker on my phone just before 11pm, there's a very welcome sight. The Seven Sisters' bows are now pointing towards New Haven, and she's steaming towards the harbour mouth. The terminal staff confirm there's been some let up in the wind, and the captain is going to give it a go. In so far as 14 people in the turtle can cause jubilation, there's mild jubilation among the passengers. By 11.15, it's evident that the captain's tactic of giving it a go has paid off, and the Seven Sisters is safely within the breakwaters and soon docking up. It's a come down from our jubilation and Easter egg high that nothing much then happens for us for an hour while the long task of unloading the Sussex-bound cars and lorries takes place. At last, at half past midnight, we're ushered into a still bleaker waiting room and then onto a bus. Yes, there's another English bus to go yet. Between the loading of the cars and the loading of the freight, we happy band of foot passengers scuttle into the gaping mouth of the bright yellow Seven Sisters and begin the long climb to the passenger decks. All credit to the captain and crew of the Seven Sisters, they manage a pretty efficient turnaround. Like me, they're probably wondering just how long the weather window will last. At a few minutes after 1am, barely an hour behind schedule, we're going astern down the River Ouse, past New Haven's endless riverside scrapyards, out past the beach and the breakwaters, and finally out into a choppy but somewhat calmer channel where we execute a 180 degree turn and set our bows south southeastwards towards Normandy. As the nominally English ship of the pair running this route, the other is called the Cote d'Alabatre, there have been some fascinating attempts to anglicise the Seven Sisters, like the Salon Agatha Christie. Hmm, you've got the wrong detectives there, mes amis. It's Sherlock Holmes who uses this route in the final problem, having leapt from the Dover boat train at Canterbury to evade Moriarty's pursuit in a hired special train. Such quibbles aside, the Seven Sisters is a really nice ship, though very clearly of her time. Constructed in 2006, the decor is very much late Chiracism on the high seas. Supposedly run by Transmanche Ferries, this is really Danish-owned DFDS, operating a contract on behalf of the Département Saint-Maritime, who heavily subsidise the survival of the route, and ensure a properly paid crew, unlike many cross-channel ferries. They'd happily serve me up a full dinner at 1am, but my hunger pangs have largely gone. Just time for a quick Tarte Citron before retiring. So good evening from the Seven Sisters, about 30 minutes out of New Haven on our way wallowing across a somewhat choppy English channel, uh, I think a little calmer than it was earlier, uh, towards Dieppe, uh, about one hour, five minutes late, leaving New Haven. We have uh, two and a half hours on the timetable, connection time in Dieppe, so fingers very much crossed uh, that with delay doesn't mount up at all. Um, see, great that we've got this far. Sorry that we had to 
slightly beat the purists and uh, take a five minute train journey at one point just to keep this thing on track. But uh, fingers crossed, tomorrow will be a somewhat smoother. So good night from me and good night from Turtle. s'il vous plaît, nous approchons bientôt de notre port de destination. Nous espérons que vous avez effectué une agréable traversée. Il est rappelé aux passagers de cabine qui sont... Sure, it's on mercredi. Even if it was a bit bumpy and crashy at times, we clearly made up time overnight and our delay is down to 30 minutes. We've been informed that foot passengers will be disembarking last, sigh, so time to have a quick peruse of my guidebook to tour in Normandy over breakfast. Highly up to the minute, published in 1900, it reassures me that there is no place in Normandy where one cannot wear a knickerbocker suit with an easy conscience. Phew, that's my wardrobe sorted. In a change to the advertised programme, foot passengers end up disembarking almost first, thanks to effective blackmail by the port shuttle bus driver who has parked his bus blocking one of the vehicle gangways. So, to get things moving, they want to move us too. Merci, monsieur. Thanks to the limited foot passenger numbers, I'm very quickly stamped into the EU by the French border guards. Play the Marseillaise. Play it. In the summer, there's rumours of a bus to link the ferry port with Dieppe Town Centre. Certainly not in April, but it's not an unpleasant walk. First down an odd road squeezed between the chalk cliffs and the high fence of the port, then a stroll beside the River Ark to reach the still very active fishing basin. I have an hour or so before the first bus in the right direction, so I stroll down to the town Shingle Beach. On the 19th of August 1942, this was Red Beach, one of the landing sites of the disastrous raid on Dieppe, the first significant Allied landing attempt in Western Europe since the fall of France. The town was held for a few hours, but at the cost of the lives of 3,600 of the 6,000 strong force, mainly Canadian. Many died bogged down in this very shingle. It's time to wander on, through the old town and past the inner harbour to the railway station. Don't worry, there's not going to be any more trains if I can help it. But French rural buses are odd beasts. Either very infrequent services run on behalf of local government, or they're SNCF replacement services for long closed railways. Our first French bus is the latter, and to confuse matters still further, you have to buy tickets for it on the SNCF app at what look awfully like rail ticket prices. That means it departs from some bays at the back of the railway station, opposite the fascinatingly named Sport Concept Drinking Establishment, which sadly isn't open at 7am. Is it a bus? Is it a coach? Is it a train? It's a Ligne Routière Régionale, apparently, so take your pick. Railway e-ticket happily scanned, and I'm comfortably ensconced for an hour's journey down the valley of the Béthune into the green heart of eastern Normandy. Every bus in this corner of Normandy is fitted with bike hooks on the back. Fantastic multimodal integration, though I'd be worried about someone running into my precious steed from behind. I'd forgotten just how smooth French main roads can be. There's just no comparison to being bounced along Sussex B roads last night. We cross the railway we are replacing, stopping by the old level crossings in lieu of stations. Remarkably, this closed line used to be the main line from Paris to Dieppe, but as Dieppe declined as a passenger port, trains ended up being concentrated on a more circuitous route via Rouen. Much of the former line is now a very popular cycle path, part of a London to Paris route. I'll try that in 24 hours next. <coughs> Thank you. 
I'm a huge fan of the village bus shelters built in the local vernacular half-timbered style. Very cute. We've been steadily filling up with school kids along the way. They all descend at Mesnier en Bray, Madame the bus driver coaxing a polite, if surly au revoir from each as they leave the bus. 40 minutes in and we're at the main town on this route, Neufchâtel en Bray, a town best known to the outside world for a delicious semi-soft cheese with a velvety rind in the shape of a heart. I half planned to get an earlier bus here on the strength of that before sensibly realising no one would be doing cheese tastings at 7am. <laughs> And there's some handsome cows to produce the cheese. We're at a confusing junction where we leave the valley of the Sorson for the valley of its tributary, the Orson. Looking at this mildly familiar landscape, I can sort of understand why our Norman overlords thought England rightfully theirs. As we're changing between SNCF buses, it's appropriate that this takes place at an archetypal French junction railway station. Cercueur provides all the ingredients, a town built up around its station, a café de la gare across the road, a smart little mairie, and a railway station far too large for the traffic it handles today. With the next four trains actually being buses, there's just me and one other passenger in the silent station hall, along with the memories of the railway workers who died for France. Spot on time, a suspiciously familiar bus pulls into the station car park and we're off on the second part of the 527 route. It's a short run up the hill to forge les eaux one of those forgotten spa towns you're never more than 10 kilometres from in France, surviving off generous health insurance policies. Forge became trendy when Cardinal Richelieu popped in to take the waters and has stayed a bit more classy than the competition ever since. <laughs> We meander through the archetypal little village of Neuf Marche, where giant scissors mark the hairdresser's shop. This is the last settlement in our first French département, Seine-Maritime. Beyond here, we're in the Oise. Paris is starting to appear on the signs now, though it still feels a million miles away from this quiet landscape. The classic French tree-lined road was allegedly introduced by Napoleon to keep his troops cool as they marched. Today, beyond aesthetics, their primary role is to provide something for over-enthusiastic drivers to wrap their cars around on the way back from the bar to back. Pulling up outside Gisors half-timbered station, the overflowing car park shows that this is where the electric outer suburban trains from Paris terminate. The capital is indeed within touching distance. So what's the challenge, Joe, I hear you ask? You've got 63 kilometres to go and six and a half hours to do it in. Even on buses, that's not hard. No, it shouldn't be, but French public transport outside the big cities basically runs some services in the morning peak, one at lunchtime and a couple more in the evening peak. We're at the end of the morning service. Basically, no more buses leave Gisors this side of midday. Gisors' tourism slogan is C'est déjà la Normandie. It's the first Norman town you come to from Paris. For me, it's more C'est presque l'île de France. Frustratingly unreachable for a few hours yet. Never mind, Gisors is an intriguing little town.
My 1900 Normandy guidebook goes into raptures about Gisors' huge parish church, largely on account of its bizarre tripartite facade. One of the most interesting monuments in France, it gushes, strange at first sight, perhaps a little desolate and repelling. I'll give it this much, it's certainly unbalanced. It somehow ended up with three different architectural styles at the front, including a completed Gothic North Tower and an incomplete Doric South Tower. Church authorities were forbidden to complete it, as it could have provided a platform for cannons to bombard the castle. Speaking of the castle, that's rather fabulous too. A near-perfect Motton Bailey, which then got defensive out of walls at a later date, with the space between them now lovely gardens in which to compare notes with the turn-of-the-century English traveller in his knickerbocker suit. These being the borderlands between Normandy and France, and therefore sometimes England and France, Gisors Castle has seen more than its fair share of changing hands. Built in 1097 by the Norman Earl of Shrewsbury, besieged by rebel Norman lords in 1120, then seized by Philip II of France in 1193, taken by Richard the Lionheart in 1194, returned to the French by treaty in 1419, then taken back by the English later the same year. Eventually, the English were expelled for a final time in 1449, and after that, the chateau got a good earned rest, other than being used as a Prussian garrison in the Franco-Prussian War and some people digging it up to try to find Knights Templar treasure. Unsuccessfully, obviously. The witching hour of twelve is upon us, so I'm waiting by the castle ramparts for the lunchtime bus onwards. I've got my fare ready because this leg is an absolute bargain. Despite being a journey from a town in the Eure department to one in the Val de Oise department, most of the trip is in the department of Oise, and their local government has adopted a policy of a one euro flat fare on their bus network. For me, that one euro will take me 40 kilometres. The bus is almost full and the weather is warm. The former is a first for this journey since Croydon, the latter a first at all. It's a Wednesday, which means a half day for most French school children. I remember being very jealous of this until I realised it was a quid pro quo for going to school on Saturday mornings instead. At chamois en bexin we meet a fleet of school buses ferrying children home. Outside the Collège Saint-Exupéry, the most French-looking gaggle of teachers ever hang around the gate, clearly demob happy at seeing the last of their charges onto the 609. Beyond Chaumont, we climb onto a high exposed plateau which bounds the Seine Valley to the north. To reach the village of Lierville, we take what is likely the last little diversion down the country lane of the journey, to reach this sandstone hamlet, so different from the half timber villages I've become used to across Normandy. This is the 609's last stop before 20 minutes non stop run to Sergy. Basically, this is the last village in the Was, and the Departement isn't letting any Ile de France sites get their sweaty paws on their heavily subsidised 1 euro fares. massive ecological deserts of agribusiness. We're on a dual carriageway now, racing towards Sergi. Mrs Turtle isn't too sure about this overtaking arc. We're pulling into the vast, elongated Paris overflow town of Sergi. Something that is just great to see when you're racing against the clock is Europe's largest clock. Sergi is the outer limit of Paris's express rail network, the RVR, and as the terminus, Sergi Saint Christophe station was adorned with this huge two faced clock above its ticket hall in 1985. As recently as 1968, Sergi was a Seine side village with barely 3,000 inhabitants. Designated as one of the numerous new towns on the Ile de France, it's now at nearly 55,000. The 609 terminates at Sergi Prefecture, or at least near it. The area around it is being dug up for about a decade, so I've even printed myself out a map to find my way from the temporary bus stop, through the construction works and various dystopian passages to the RER station. 
I need to visit here to purchase a Navigo Easy card. The Ile de France's contactless replacement for those nice little carnets of green cardboard metro and bus tickets every Paris visitor used to know. From here on, all our buses will be covered by the Navigo Easy card. I just touch in to start using up the 10 flat fare tickets I've loaded onto it. The next bus provides our leap from the outer banlieue of the Ile de France to the suburbs of Paris proper. This is the 9512. The 95 in the number refers to the number assigned to the Val d'Oise Departement. We start off with a bit of fast auto route running to get us out of Sergi, leap over the canalised River Oise, then we're twisting around bloated commuter villages. Endless streets of pristine, blasted clean villas. Every few minutes we pull up at an RER station, the bus empties, then gradually fills up on the way to the next. I'm pretty much the only through passenger. We're well beyond the scope of my Normandy guide now, so I pull out my Paris Baydecker to provide some background to the next town. According to the 1884 author, the wine of Argentoil is mediocre, but its asparagus is justly celebrated. I love wine, and I'm deeply sceptical about asparagus, so this may not be my sort of place. We leave the 9520 just short of its terminus at the Place Francois Rabelais in Val d'Argentoy. I don't have time for an in-depth exploration, but I feel its market gardens and vineyards may be long in the past. We're still in the Val d'Oise, but this is basically Paris now. For bus users, that's a plus and a minus. I'm back in the world of real-time information on my mobile. On the other hand, no one publishes any proper timetables for Paris buses, just vague frequencies. I begin to feel the pressure a bit now. In theory, there isn't far to go, but there's no Parisian equivalent to the X68 to race me to the centre. It's three all-stop buses still to go, and unknown quantities of traffic. The 164 that turns up is reassuring in its familiar RATP turquoise livery. We must be in Paris, but less so that it's apparently terminating short at Place de l'Europe. This could put things in jeopardy. It's a painfully slow crawl through Argentoil, down narrow streets which seem to be almost constantly blocked by builders' vans. The bus is packed, the minutes are ticking away and there's no obvious alternative at Place de l'Europe but to wait for the next 164 nearly 15 minutes behind. I've got that red hill feeling, this is slipping through my fingers. Things improve as we make a, the first of several crossings of the Seine, Battleship Grey and Cormorant haunted, and the bus speeds up significantly. At Cité des Musiciennes, a lady leaps through the closing doors to return a child's dropped plastic sword, probably making her the rightful Queen of France or something. Then, as we pull up at Place de l'Europe and I prepare to leap off, a wonderful thing happens. The driver yells back down the bus, Pas le terminus, nous continuerons à Paris. I could happily kiss him, once on each cheek, obviously. This is Paris, not the south of France. Appropriately, the sun has come out for our next crossing of the meandering Seine, which is now blue and sparkling. We're crossing here to the narrow Ile de la Jatte, once a famous artist's playground among its trees, made most famous by Surat's painting of a Sunday afternoon here. The bus is emptying and we're coursing at good speed along broad boulevards. At last, we're crossing the trench of the Peripherique, the multi-lane ring road built on the east course of the old city walls. I know I said I was in Paris proper before, but this is Paris proper proper. At its terminus, we leap from our last extra Muros bus, jog through a complex of roadworks at the Porte de Champetre, where they're building yet another tram line for Paris, to locate the rather hidden starting point for the first of our intramuros buses, the 92. I can confess I've never been on a Paris bus before. With such a dense metro network, both in terms of lines and how close the stations are, 
and the ticket price has been the same, I've often wondered why Central Paris needs quite so many buses. I think the basic answer is accessibility, yeah, yeah, which the yeah, metro is rubbish yeah. at. Also, turns out they're great for sightseeing. From Europe's largest and possibly most anarchic roundabout at the Place de la Concorde, the 92 heads back towards the Seine, and at the riverbank at the Place de l'Alma, we're going to make our final interchange. The shining sculpture here is a replica of the Statue of Liberty's flame, gifted to the city by the International Herald Tribune in the 1980s, in a sort of bizarre, here's a small replica of part of a present you gave us a while back gesture. Rather than the symbol of American-French friendship, it's instead become an informal shrine to Princess Diana above the fateful underpass. And look, there's the Crystal Palace TV mast. I thought we'd come further than that. Just under three quarters of an hour to go and I've conspired to just miss two bunch 72s. Luckily, this Riverside bus is a pretty frequent route, so before long we're testing the suspension on the endless couples past a non-stop parade of Paris's Seine side sights. <laughs> can't take the local government officer out of me. My final stop had to be the Hotel de Ville, Paris's town hall. Ten minutes to go and it's just a quick walk. One final crossing of the Seine and onto the Ile de la Cité. Twenty-three hours and fifty-five minutes. Just about made it. Good afternoon, just got up to five o'clock French time. About uh, 10 minutes ago, arrived here at Notre Dame, the zero point of France and Paris. Uh, unfortunately, zero point itself is hidden under the uh, works to restore the cathedral after the fire, uh, but we got as close to it as possible with five minutes to spare on the 24 hours. Uh, incredible journey, it's been incredibly difficult sort of points, we had a storm, we had a bus that just didn't turn up, um, and it does mean, unfortunately, we didn't do it in the most pure sense because we did end up getting a train for four miles uh, from Gatwick Airport to Three Bridges. Um, had we done this entirely by bus plus the ferry then we could have beaten the Morecambe record from bus 24 by four kilometres. Um, but as it is I think Morecambe still stands. Uh, I don't know if I'll try doing Paris again in 24 hours uh, at some distant point in the future, uh, but it's been great fun. Thank you so much for coming along uh, yeah, and thank you for the encouragement and uh, support. And um, thank you. Uh, I'm about to head off to my hotel, which I've just discovered I can get a bus to. So goodbye from me and from Turtle. <laughs>